I speak to you in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. It's too good to be true. I can't help but think those must have been the thoughts that Thomas was thinking when all of his friends told him that Jesus had returned. Just a few hours earlier, the disciples had locked all of the doors in the house where they had gathered. Like any reasonable person, they were all still completely devastated about the murder of Jesus just days earlier. So they were still trying to regroup and figure out what to do now that the one person on whom they'd placed all of their hopes and all of their dreams had died. But even more than that, they were scared. They were absolutely terrified that the crowds that had crucified Jesus on Friday would come for them next. But Thomas wasn't there. He wasn't in this room with locked doors. We aren't told where he was. Maybe he was out getting food for everyone else. Maybe he was checking to make sure that his family was safe. Whatever the reason, Thomas wasn't there. But everyone else was, just huddled together. Every noise caused them to jump. Every sound at the door caused their heart to skip a beat. And then, all of a sudden, someone's standing right in front of them. No one had heard a knock at the door. No one had gotten up to undo the locks, and no one had opened the door. But nonetheless, here someone was standing right in front of them. So this strange man starts showing them his his right hand. There's a scar there. And then he shows them his left, another scar. And then he moves his tunic to the side, and you can see where a spear had gone into his flesh. And it was only after seeing these scars that the disciples realized that their teacher and their friend and their Lord had really and truly done the unthinkable and come back from the dead. Their hopes, much like Jesus, were not dead, but more alive than ever. So can you imagine the excitement when Thomas got back? Everyone's trying to tell him what happened. I, I, can, I can almost hear the whole thing. Thomas, he was right there. I mean, literally right there in the middle of the room. I swear it was him. It was Jesus. He, sh- he showed us his scars and everything. It was him. He was there. But understandably, Thomas doesn't believe them. It's too good to be true, he thinks. Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hand, unless I put my finger in the marks, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Thomas gets a bad rap for these few words. Because what the disciples were telling him really was too good to be true. Just three days earlier, he had seen Jesus brutally murdered. So can you imagine the disappointment if he allowed himself to believe that that maybe he really was still alive? If it turned out not to be true, he would have to relive all of that grief, relive all of that disappointment. So his doubts serve as this form of self protection. And on top of that, he's asking for exactly what the other disciples got. He's just asking to see the scars. He's just asking to touch them. And yet for 2,000 years, Thomas has been remembered as doubting Thomas. I don't think this is fair. For one, we've seen that his doubts were reasonable. 
But also, Thomas's doubts aren't the main focus of the story. John doesn't linger on Thomas's doubts or even on Thomas, but he immediately moves the story along with Jesus returning a week later. And Jesus came the second time the same way he had come the first. Again, he appears though the doors had been shut. But this time Thomas was there and he speaks directly to him. Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. He doesn't chastise Thomas's doubt. He doesn't shame Thomas for his doubt, but he gives him exactly what he asked for. He lets him touch the scars on his hands and his side. You see, the focus isn't on Thomas's doubt, but on Jesus's overwhelming graciousness. The focus isn't on Thomas's lack of faith, but on Jesus's overabundance of generosity. The focus isn't on Thomas needing something to believe, but on Jesus giving him what he needed. Thomas needed to see something. He needed to touch something. He needed something tangible and solid and physical to hold on to. So when the thought of resurrection was way too good to be true, Jesus met him exactly where he was. We're exactly one week into the Easter season. There are still those of us who feel like we never left Lent. There are those of us so mired in the things of Lent, like sin and death and darkness, that the thought of resurrection seems far too good to be true. Like Thomas, unless we have proof, we won't believe. We need something to see. We need, we need something to touch. We need something tangible to hold on to. As with Thomas, so also with us. When the thought of resurrection is too good to be true, Jesus meets us exactly where we are. He gives us something solid to see. He gives us something concrete to touch. He gives us something tangible to hold on to. But instead of showing us his scars, he gives us things like water and oil. He gives us things like bread and wine. He gives us sacraments. He meets us, our, he meets us where we are in tangible, ordinary things that like his body have been transformed into something extraordinary. They're solid, they're physical and concrete signs that this news, this news that God has defeated death by dying and rising, this news that all of us and all of creation will share in that resurrection, this news that seems far too good to be true, is in fact true. A few months ago, I helped at a, at a baptism in Nashville. And the priest there gave one of the absolute best baptism preparation kind of services for the parents that I have ever heard. And one of the things that he pointed out was that there's a reason why we go directly from baptism into communion. There's a reason why we go from the font immediately into the table because the two are intimately connected. He then told the group gathered about when his oldest son first moved away from home. And for months after his son left, he and his wife continued to, to set a place for his son at the table at dinner. It was this, 
the sign out of habit that no matter how far the child left, there would always be a place for him at the table. And the priest continued, that's exactly what happens in baptism. When Henry and Nolan enter those waters in a few minutes, God sets a place for them at God's table. And no matter what they do at any point in their life, no matter how far they run, there will always be a place for them at God's table. And so when each of us gathered here today see the water wash over their heads, and as we see the oil rubbed across their foreheads, we're invited to remember what it felt like when we entered those same waters. We're invited to remember what it felt like when we were sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. On your way to communion, you may even dip your fingers in the water and make the sign of the cross as a physical remembrance of this. And in that remembering, we're also reminded that God has set a place at that table for each of us as well. And no matter what you do or what you have done or how far you run away, that place will always be set at the table. No matter how much faith you have or don't have, that place will always be set at the table. And no matter how many times you feel Thomas's doubt or feel that all of, all of this is too good to be true, that place will still be set at the table. When you need something to see, whenever you need something to touch, whenever you need something tangible to hold on to, that place will always be set at the table. Amen.